Yeah, and we are live, I believe. So people are diving in right now. Um, here come the participants. Look at this, towards them, just pouring in to listen to the mighty through the gates. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're just swarming in. It's actually it's been a very very um, popular one. We had a lot of people responding, and and um, you know we're we're full, so we're kind of at max participation um for this and obviously loads of people will be watching it live on facebook as well any number of people um and we've had a ton of questions as well so you yeah, know so really um it's going to be it's going to be an, uh, an interesting chat i think what well, i hope my question is was steph's full i have to know the, the huge 100 as well was it 99 98 state, state secrets i'm afraid we got oh, okay. sure we can divulge that i'd have to ask steph <laughs> um, i believe yeah. it was 95 it's yeah i'm I don't, you know i don't want to i don't want to i don't want to i don't want to sort of big anyone up but you know it may it may be that you that you that you've picked him at the post it may be i'll be the first sold out one it, it cool. could be so yeah i don't i don't want to i don't want to i don't want to go into that too long you know and, and defame the man because he's not here to defend himself but um uh but yeah you may have picked him at the post and you know we are going to get him back obviously with um with johan cool so we're gonna we're gonna have them both on That'll be good. Just so that Johan can... Uh... That'll be chaos, but it'll be good. <laughs> it'll be chaos. Yeah. As long as they're not in the same room, you've got a chance, I think. <laughs> it'll be chaos. Making that uh, one work. Uh, <laughs> I think three is probably the max for those two. If I, if I had anyone else in, it would just be... Yeah, it would just be ridiculous. Yeah, and it'll be four hours as well. Yeah. <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> um, so, yeah, people are joining and signing in, which is really good. Um, and we're only two minutes past eight, so a lot of people are on time, which is good to see. Um, but we're going to crack on, and they will hopefully join in um, as they come. Um, we cool. don't want to keep people hanging around because we're punctual around here. That's it. Um, I know you're a punctual man. So, yes, it's a great pleasure to be back once again with the Parkour Dialogues. Um, I hope everyone's well who's out there and listening. And thank you for joining us. Um, a bit of housekeeping tonight. If you do have a question and you want to pop it in the chat, um, then please do. Uh, we won't answer you in the chat because we're busy talking. But um, we are monitoring that chat. So if a really good question appears in that chat, we will hopefully pick it out later if we've got the time. Um, but if we don't respond... Yeah, and actually, you know, write an answer to you. Don't be offended. It's just because um, it's taking all our focus, uh, us not being that bright. It's taking all our focus just to chat through this medium. So, um, but we, we will hopefully get your questions. We have had a ton of questions come in. Um, so if we don't get to your question, don't feel bad. It's just that we can't answer. We can't ask all of them because we've had loads sent in over the last week. Um, and we have to sort of pick and choose. And also your question may have been, uh, it might get lumped in with others because a lot of people ask similar questions. So, um, so even if even if we don't directly um, relate to your question, it, it may it may still get answered kind of in someone else's. Hopefully, we've tried to sort of pick and choose amongst them. Um, so that's the only housekeeping for tonight, people. Um, and uh, I'm overjoyed tonight uh, to have the mighty Chris Rowett, uh, who otherwise known as Blaine in the parkour community. We might get into that at some stage, the, the mysterious nickname that probably not many people know the origin of. Um, uh, and Chris is one of the first generation of practitioners in the UK, taking up parkour in 2003 uh, and never looking back. Amongst the community today, he's one of the best known practitioners, one of the most respected teachers of the discipline anywhere in the world. Uh, his early training videos were watched by almost every community, inspiring people everywhere with his clean, accurate and strong movements and his unparalleled commitment to the practice. His blog, Power is Nothing Without Control, was one of the first high quality blogs uh, on parkour training, providing a relatable and informative account of his thoughts on his own training and wider concepts. Chris eventually moved to London to join Parkour Generations, where he became a central figure and eventually went on to manage the Parkour Generations London Academy and our coaching department, um, uh, traveling to scores of countries to lead workshops, events, seminars, uh, and the like. Uh, he's also been working with the London Fire Brigade since 2018, a childhood dream, I believe. Chris is also a senior tutor at ADAPT Qualifications and was on uh, as an early board member at Parker UK, the world's first national governing body. He's always been a powerful role model for practitioners all over the world, sharing his insights into training, solo practice, mindset, and more. And that's why we've got him on the Parkour Dialogues tonight. My name's Dan Edwards. Um, and welcome, Chris. Thank you very much, Dan. That was a ridiculous intro, but um, <laughs> thank you. I appreciate it. It's actually, it's actually a very selective intro because the amount I realized as I was kind of thinking about that and piecing it together, like the amount of stuff I could write from our 
you know, however long we've known each other, 13 years, 12 years, something like that. Um, uh, the amount of stuff I could write is, is huge. Like the amount of things you've done, as we've just been discussing, the amount of things that you've done with me, we, that we've both done, and that I know you've been involved in without me, it's a huge list. Um, so it's to say like list. he's traveled around the world to teach workshops and events, it's like, you know, it's a massive understatement. You've, you've done a lot in a short time. Uh, certainly with the, the travel side of things, yeah, 100%. As we were discussed before we went live on this, it's, um, it's hard to keep track of the amount of countries you've been to um, and the amount of places that we've, we've been to share ideas about parkour and about training and um, I guess the philosophy and the, the methodologies. So it's, uh, there's a lot to try and remember. And I tried to sit down before all this and write down almost a timeline of where I went when and it was impossible. I couldn't keep track of everything. So I did my best. So we might get into some of the uh, actual locations and people we met and things we did. Um, but it's a it's an exhaustive list, and we, we'll never cover the whole thing for sure. No, no, there's a, there's a lot to go into, and we, we are going to get into some of those stories. And we, uh, you know, I really want you to go into some of those stories, the ones you can remember uh, anyway. Um, as we discussed, there's a lot of stuff that we just don't remember because we've kind of done so many of those trips. Um, but I, the ones you remember, I do definitely want you to go into those stories at some stage. I'm going to kind of ask some questions around that, um, and there are some interesting questions from from the audience as well on that front. So, um, so yeah, one question: Who that. is this guy? <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely not, man. I mean, no. you know, I mean, my—I uh, don't know if you remember when we met. Do you remember when we met? I think we met at an indoor parkour event. Um, we did run by UF, the one where Steph was there, and I think it was the one. I think it might have been the one where they they showed Julie's film about, yep. about Steph. I think it was that event. That's where I remember meeting you. Yes, it was, it was a PK day and, um, in London. And yeah, that was where we first met you. Um, and, and then I remember that event. I think, you took, you would, I think you taught someone how to cat pass at that event. It wasn't a teaching event. It was a jam. But I remember you, I think you taught someone how to cat pass. Do you remember that? Sounds familiar. I think so. Um, I remember a big indoor gym. Uh, I remember watching the film. And I remember the, the training afterwards. And I certainly remember some cat pass happening. But um, I think I was working with some people there. Yeah, I, 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 I vaguely remember that. I think you did, and I think I remember who it was actually. So I'm going to confirm that. But um, so I remember, uh, I remember seeing you teaching there, and I, remember, I you know, I knew about knew about you obviously anyway because we'd seen the videos, and everyone sort of knew each other in the community about then and watched each other online or whatever. So, um, and then we we were on the tube, we t we were on the tube when we left. I don't know if you remember, but you, me, and Forrest, and a few others. That's right. Yeah. You remember okay. that? Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, so we already knew you were, and, and, and it was actually that, uh, that on that tube ride, after you, that tube ride, um, uh, when you got off, I remember saying to Forrest at the time, I was like, we should get that guy to come to London. <laughs> <laughs> like, straight away, I was like... That didn't we, take long. Yeah, yeah we didn't take long. Yeah, and then, um, and then, um, and then exactly, and of course, you moved, you moved down soon after. But the, yeah. the point is, I, I already knew you were, obviously, because of the videos, and, uh, you know, a lot of people did back then. Um, and when, when did you... That's kind of my first question. When did you become aware of how much impact you had had on the global parkour community through your videos and your blog. Cause your videos were, they definitely sort of went the equivalent of viral back then. This was kind of, you know, really on before YouTube probably. Mm -hmm. um, so, but they definitely went viral back then. They were seen by people all over the world. Um, when were you aware of the impact you were making? That's a, a tough question to start with. Um, I'm full of tough questions, man. Thanks. It's going to be a good couple of hours, but um, <laughs> it was probably when the amount of messages coming in, um, to either my email inbox or other, other places like MSN or whatever was used at the time, probably when the amount of those got to the point where it would take a significant amount of time to answer them all. At that point, I was aware that, okay, a lot more people are seeing these videos and or reading these articles or whatever it might be. Because um, it used to be maybe one or two a week and then maybe it was one or two a day. Um, and I would always try and get back to people and offer training advice and, um, answer any questions that I thought that might be able to, to help people. But um, when it became a little bit more of a, okay, I'm going to have to spend an hour each day going through these messages, replying to people and hopefully giving them some ideas on our training and hopefully helping them out. At that point, I thought maybe these videos are being seen by a lot more people or being shared in communities. Um, and there was probably some insights on, in terms of sort of stats on the blog as to how many people were reading things. And I was like, I was starting to realize that the parkour community is not that big. And yet these numbers are actually fairly significant so at that point i probably realized that um maybe what i'm doing is having an impact in some ways so i've got a bit of a responsibility there to make sure that the content i am putting out is of a good standard and um it's kind of well thought out rather than just uh 
quick replies here and there, I'd say. Cool. So you, so, and the blog went up at the same time as the videos, is that right? Power is nothing with uh, control. Did that come first or did the first video, did the video go up without that? Uh, I think there might have been a couple of videos released before the blog. So I don't think the blog started until maybe 2006 ish. Right. I'm not sure what year that first video was made. Um, but it, I think it was before that. So I think a couple of videos were made, probably shared around through the UF forums. Uh, Andy from Norwich always hosted my videos for me. So thank you, Andy. <laughs> before there was such an easy option to upload to YouTube. Um, so I think there was a few videos released, maybe even two or three videos released before the blog started. And I actually went back onto my blog and had a look at the first couple of posts today just as a reminder for myself. Um, and apparently it was Jin from Cambridge no who way. recommended that I should start a blog and, you know, share my ideas and insights on things. So if it wasn't for him, it would never have existed probably. And, and what was the first video? Do you remember that? What was the, what was the name of it? Um... Uh, there was definitely a couple of early, early ones that didn't have a name at all. Just had the, the date that it was filmed, I think. Um, they definitely exist on a CD somewhere. I'm sure I can, I can bring those out and share them if people are interested. But um, probably the first one that actually I kind of thought about a little bit and, and compiled a lot of different clips and training things and filmed over a couple of weekends was probably the uh, Power is Nothing Without Control video. Um, and I think that's the first one that I kind of shared and got a lot of quite positive feedback on as to how I was training and uh, the things that were in the, in the videos, I guess. And take us back to that time or you know, even before that time, before you were making the video. So swirl back to 2003, um, yep. which I believe is when you started training. That's right. Um, so uh, take us back there. What was, who was Blaine at that stage? Um, or who was Chris? I guess it was before you were called Blaine. Who was yep. Chris at that stage? And, um, and what was kind of going through your mind? What, what attracted you? to you to parkour you know um what what was what was your story at the beginning uh you'd have to go back probably a little bit further to find out why i got into parkour specifically so um growing up my major influence probably in terms of uh what i was drawn to i grew up watching 80s action movies as you well know so i guess my almost my male uh role model uh was were all all of these kind of 80s action movie stars throughout the years um, so I grew up watching those and they were always strong. They were always able, um, but they could move as well at the same time, all the Jackie Chan, uh, films, those sort of things. So I was really attracted to the idea of becoming a physical person and they were always the hero, right? In, in those stories. So, um, they were strong and they were able, but they used those skills and abilities to help other people. So I kind of grew up being shaped towards that being the way all adult males should eventually turn out to be. And as a young male, I thought, okay, that's, I guess, where I go from here. Um, my parents split up at a young age, and I lived with my mum, so I would see my dad semi-regularly, but I didn't have a male influence in my life at all times. So I guess they took that role on, and that was my, my, mo my model for what I should eventually become. So I got into martial arts. I got into as many sports as I could. I would just try and become stronger, more able, be able to do a lot of different things. Um, and eventually having practiced martial arts for quite a while, um, I eventually became aware of parkour. And I think when I first saw that, I realized that that's something I really wanted to pursue and get into head first. Uh, my first exposure was through the uh, Rush Hour Ident. So David Bell um, did a short BBC advert. Um, and I probably watched that five to 10 times whilst it was airing um, in between sort of commercial breaks. And every time I watched it, I, the first few times I thought it must have been CGI. It has mm. to be wire work. It can't be real. But the more you watch it, the more you realize that these movements are possible. They're just very, they look very high risk. Maybe mm. there was crash mats, that sort of thing. But it, it looked too realistic to have been faked. Uh, there was a newspaper article at some point around that time that I read that kind of talked about that um, advert and how it was put together and the way it was done. And that's where I found out that it was all real. It was done those rooftop jumps actually happened. Um, and then shortly after that, the Channel 4 documentary Jump London was the first sort of time I became aware that this was a, a practice. It was a training system. And I was very excited to kind of, I was looking forward to that show coming out to try and find out more information because I could immediately recognize that that was the same as that. I recognized that that was the same thing happening in this rush hour, sort of small, small commercial. So, um, 
watched Jump London. And straight after that is when I started training. The next day, um, a friend and I had watched that. And we tried to go out and replicate some of the movements. And that was the beginning of the, the 17 and counting year journey to get to sort of this point. So that's, that's who I was before in a very, in a nutshell. Um, that's how I found parkour. And I guess my impression of it in the beginning was, was different to, to have what it is now and along the way, but that's how I, that's how I got started. Uh, and picking up on that, um, you know, the action hero thing. So that was kind of, I guess for you sort of eighties, nineties, right? Late eighties, yeah. early nineties. Um, and you know, obviously a lot of, uh, you, you're not alone. A lot of, a lot of people, including me grew up the same way, inspired by the same kind of things in many ways. Um, and it was, you know, it's a different age, I suppose now, you know, a fair amount of time has, has passed and the, and the world is very, very different now. Um, and now, you know, you're a father, I know you're a father as well. So um, how, when, when you think to, when you think back to the, the role models you had growing up in that way, um, do you think now that they are, do you, would you like those to be role models for your kids? Do you think, do you think that's good or do you have any issues with it now? Or do you think, no, no, I, I turned out all right. Therefore it's great that I watched Arnold Schwarzenegger mowing down thousands of people every, every day. <laughs> um, you know, so what do, what do you think about that? Or do you ever think about that? I think I justified that as them all being like really bad people, you know, um, who had kidnapped his daughter or whatever it might've been. So at the time right. it didn't seem that bad, but looking back on it now, it's like, yeah, he did just murder 300 people. Um, so maybe, maybe there's some issues there, you know, <laughs> um, but yeah, it was a different time, it was a different period. And it was, it was kind of the way movies were going at, at that time. So maybe they, I would say they were not perfect role models. And actually that's maybe the appeal in some ways as well. They weren't perfect at all. They all had their flaws. And um, it's not a good lesson really that people do have flaws and you do make mistakes and, and things happen. Um, but kind of their core values were always on point. Their moral compass always kind of recalibrated back towards the same sort of way, which was in a good direction. So, I think they were just good examples of human beings in some ways. Um, they're flawed. They try and walk a good path most of the time. Um, as to my children, they will definitely be growing up watching a whole host of 80s action movies. <laughs> so um, I will be actively using them as examples. I will definitely um, pick and choose the ones I'll show them. There'll be a few that will be chopped out or left till later. But um, I think the education will begin soon as to uh, that eighties journey. We'll go from there. <laughs> I don't say, well, yeah, I mean, you know, I fully support that. I'm sure there are a lot of people out there that, 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 that think that's pretty weird, but you know, I fully support that hundred percent of board with that approach. Yeah. I'm a weird man. It's, it's yeah. fine. I can do that. <laughs> and obviously I have a, I have a young daughter, so um, it'd be really cool to go back and pick up on all of the sort of, you know, eighties and nineties female role models. Um, you've got Sarah Connor from Terminator two who was um, the first female I ever saw doing pull-ups. Uh, and the, the cool thing was at the time, I didn't really see it as an unusual thing. It's just a person doing pull-ups. Mm. And it wasn't until a little bit later on that I realized that's kind of unusual, especially for its time. So to have James Cameron as a director bringing in someone and saying, okay, we want you to be strong. And actually putting those pull-ups in a film uh, that early on uh, was really cool. And you got Vasquez from Aliens, same sort of thing. You get to see her doing pull-ups in a film. Really, really cool. So that sort of thing of... Um, being a badass um, and being female and that not being an unusual thing. That's really cool. When there's a lot of films that explore that as, as, it, as they should. So I'll definitely be steering my daughter towards a lot of positive female role models uh, and male ones, because um, it's good to experience both sides of that. And um, yeah, the education will begin very soon. Once she gets past <laughs> all that Disney stuff, you know, give her another year and then we'll be moving on to um, Schwarzenegger and uh, Stallone. Hey man, I like that Disney stuff. That's Gorney Weaver. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah and there's so many, you know, much better, uh, you know, so many amazing female role models now, especially in the movies. It's just uh, much more know, now. Yeah, a, a different world, which is super cool. So yeah, yeah Indy's going to grow up in a, in a in a good world in that way. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And obviously, her her mother is um, sort of role model number one, and kind of her whole world at the moment, um, as it should be for for a young a young girl. Uh, and I'm, I'm really sort of happy to see how that turns out as well because having someone like Shirley in her life um, that's going to lead to some very positive things um, mm. just being surrounded by someone who's so physical um, and so disciplined in the way they approach their training and aspects of their life I think it's going to be a very positive thing <laughs> throughout yeah. her development for sure I mean with you two as parents I mean 
she doesn't really have a lot of, you know, before she's even able to think about it, I'm sure she's going to already be kind of monstrously strong and fit and capable, even before she gets to work out whether she wants to be or not, <laughs> just, just from following you guys around. It'll be a byproduct. Maybe. Yeah. So and then she yeah, we'll can decide see. later. But yeah, no, I mean, that's, um, yeah, everyone, everyone loves it. She's super cool. So, um, Bringing it back to to the parkour, to the um, your your you starting out. So I think you you started the day after Jump London, right? Uh, that's correct. Yeah, yeah. So you went out, you started training, but there weren't very few teaching resources, none back then, right? So what was your early training like? Um, it was very. Um, it was based around exploration and trying things, um, or watching Jump London because we'd recorded it. My friend Tom and I. Who I knew from college and school before that, uh, we'd recorded it and we watched it back and we we rewatched it many times to try and figure out, okay, how did they? Where were their hands during that movement? Mm-hmm. How did they land? How much did they bend their knees? So it was an it was a, a learning process of watching that, um, making a few sort of mental notes, going out trying those movements. Um, sometimes getting them wrong, sometimes getting a little bit of progress and thinking, okay, that, I made a little bit of progress there, but I did something wrong. Go back, watch it again, try it again. And along the way, accidentally discovering a lot of other things as well. So that, okay, we didn't make that, but this seemed to almost work as well. So let's explore that area a bit more and see where it goes. And then just getting a general feel for what is parkour. So based around the philosophy that's discussed throughout the documentary, um, if it's just about finding challenges that kind of talk to you and learning ways to overcome them, then we should be looking for not just copying movements that we see in a documentary, but how do we... um, find challenges that talk to us approach those and then figure out a way to to move past them so i guess at that point there was a very quick moment where we branched off in our own direction used that as a kind of resource and library of ideas and that library grew through forums and other other um areas but that original source of having a few videos here and there definitely helped to provide some ideas and inspiration and the rest of it came from, I guess, our imagination. So we're a very, very small group at that time. So two, three people at any one time. Um, this is Leicester, right? Started. That was in Hinkley, which is a small town 11 miles from Leicester. Right. So it's just, just outside Leicester. Um, so it's a small town. And it was actually a really good training area, to be honest with you. It's kind of rural and kind of uh, urban. It's got a nice little mix to it in some ways. Um, So there was always quite a a wide um, range of training opportunities there. Um, But we're a very small group. We had very limited resources in terms of information. So we just uh, gave it our best shot and trained a lot. Went from there. And what were the, um, what do you think is the biggest upside from that introduction to parkour? And what do you think is the biggest kind of downside or the biggest, you know, the biggest limitation from that introduction? I think the biggest upside would be that, there's a, there's a level of creativity that has to build quite quickly at that point because you haven't got this unlimited resource of YouTube um, or videos that you'll find now where you could just almost learn all of the physical movements just by watching other people do them and then just go and replicate that and, and learn that at that stage. So I feel very fortunate to have been there towards the beginning when it sort of crossed over to the UK because um, it was still very, very early stages and it was an opportunity to then use my own creativity and develop my way of moving without being too influenced by other resources or other sort of um, people or, or things. So I think that's a, a, it was a huge benefit to, to be there at the time where it was undeveloped and quite uh, young. Mm. Uh, I feel fortunate to have been around at that time. And you could almost look at it the opposite way in that it, the progress was probably a lot slower than someone that started today. Someone that starts today has a lot of resources and a lot of um, information out there. It's almost too much information in some ways, but um, you probably find that if they were dedicated and they were sensible and they, they looked into it quite a lot before they started training, they would take a very quick route to get to a point that took me sort of many years perhaps. But um, I think by taking many years to get to the point that they would reach quickly, uh, it reinforced a lot of foundations, a lot of basics. I had to repeat things many, many times before I even realized there was another way of doing something. So I think it built a very strong foundation. Um, and I, I'm really grateful to have that, to, to have had that experience and have taken a slower journey compared to if I started now, I would say. 
Mm, and that's a rare, I mean, these days that's kind of a rare thing right now. Nowadays, everyone wants everything yesterday. And as you say, you can get access to information so quickly and easily. You know, a lot of people, they just want to learn this, you know, I just want to learn how to do a backflip. I want to learn this. I want to learn this. I want to learn this. They come in and they, they see it all achieved at such a high level that they kind of think that, um, you know, they should, they should be able to do that pretty quickly. So they come in and they have those fast expectations and it mm -hmm. becomes um, seen in the same way as just, you know, it's just a, it's just a set of movement skills. Let's just, let's just bang them out, learn them. How can I learn them as quickly as possible? So that is that rare these days. Do you think, do you think it's, do you think it's harder to come to the understanding you came to because of the access to information that we have now? I think it's easy. I think it's harder to develop some of the, um, foundational aspect of parkour such as redeveloping your creativity or your kind of own personal approach to moving i think it's harder to be quite independent and develop your own approach to training now because you are bombarded with all these different options and kind of models of how you might want to train or move so it's very difficult now to create something new in terms of like a physical movement whereas when i started i didn't hear of i didn't know what a muscle up was until maybe 2005 ish perhaps so i practiced parkour for two years before i even had heard of the word or known it was a thing um and now you'll open up a, a parkour forum or you'll type it into google and you'll be presented with a massive list of movements that you can then start going it's almost a box ticking exercise you can go out there and just tick your way through them as you learn them so um i think that it's easier now to get into parkour and kind of figure out what's going on but i think it's it would take a rare person to almost ignore that and push that to the side and say it's great to have that resource but i'm going to explore a little bit myself and see where i want to go with this and i can come back and have a look at what happened before and learn from those mistakes that people made so i don't make those but also just try and walk my own path a little bit and see where see where that goes um i don't think very many people would do that at all there'll be a few out there um, and they'll mm. probably develop a very interesting styles and approaches to training. And it would be, be really cool to see that. But there's a large draw to just look at all of the information and think, I'm going to try and find my way through that maze rather than using that as a tool and go in your own way. So I'd like to say I'd have done the same thing in terms of going my own way slightly. But the truth is, with all the information there, I think I'd have just tried to find my way through that minefield a little bit. And it would have been a very different experience mm. if that had gone that way, I think. And what about um, limitations? So, like, you know, when you when you look at the, the the access to information now and the coaching and all that, is there is there something that you look back and you think, I wish I'd had, you know, if it, imagine if we'd had that, then that you know, I would I, I I would have wanted that. Is there something that you think, in a way, your training was limited as a result of the fact that there was just you were doing it alone? There were some pros to it, but what are, what's the con? Uh, the training was limited. It was slowed down a lot. Um, less so than the, the founders. Their journey was a lot slower. Uh, I think that's also why most of them are still here in training now. It's because that journey was a lot slower and it forced them to take that route one step at a time and reinforce all those foundations before making any progress. Um, so I think that there, there are, you could look, certain people will look at, the, look at them as being cons, downsides to, to that approach. But um, I actually think that uh, I have no regrets about the way I approached that those early days. And if I had a choice now, going back to the beginning and starting then or starting with all the information that's available now, I would do the same thing again. I would try and start sooner if I could with less information um, and just try and muddle my way through. Because I think that I learned a lot of things along the way that have kept me injury free and able to listen to my body rather than using other sort of bits of information there. Would you? I, I forgot your question halfway through there. So if I didn't answer your question, you know, you you got to it, man. You got to it again. Um, right, would cool. you? Um, would you? Uh, I'm going to add to it now. Would you? If you went back, what about um, weightlifting? Would you add weightlifting earlier? I know you wrote a very famous article um, when Worlds Collide on your blog, which was about your how you came across weightlifting and how before you came across it, you you weren't uh, a fan of it for parkour and then yep. you did some and you were like okay this is actually really cool and yep. and you and you brought the two together and, and obviously you've, you've gone on to become a strength and conditioning expert yourself in your own right so would you have would you have wanted to introduce weightlifting earlier if you'd have known about the benefits yeah but i think in a, in a broader way i think i'd have, i'd go back and be a little bit more open-minded to things in general and not so um close-minded in some way so i think 
my approach was these founders did everything body weight and didn't really touch weights on the whole. Some of them did. So I must go that same sort of path. Um, okay. And you don't need weights for parkour. And I guess it, I was I was 17. So I, w I was a baby in, some, in a lot of ways. Didn't understand a lot of things about how that sort of whole world worked. And I was a little bit ignorant um, at the time as to how they could actually help me in parkour. Um, I think at the time also, I was convinced that my physical performance in parkour wasn't actually that important. I didn't want to be the strongest person in the world or have the biggest jump in the world. I wanted to be able to overcome stuff that was really hard. Um, understand exactly what my body could do uh, and I was worried I guess that adding weightlifting or other training systems to my parkour training would negatively influence sort of my mental uh, game or maybe take my physical progress okay. in a different direction I would say so yeah I would go back and be a little bit more open-minded I would look at sports on the whole and say how are these people progressing and staying injury free and what sort of training systems are they using to supplement their sport? And I would inject that a lot sooner, for sure. Mm. I wouldn't take out any of the insane physical challenges that I did. I wouldn't remove any of the conditioning methodologies that I, I used. But I would inject uh, weightlifting and strength work a lot sooner. Um, that's weightlifting as in lifting weights rather than the, the sport of weightlifting, right. which I've never spent any time with. Mm. Uh, but I went in a lot more sort of barbell work, mm. um, specifically a lot earlier, if I could go back and change things for sure. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And you're, and you're training, you, you mentioned those challenges and, and the, the, the ridiculous physical challenges and the conditioning. And, you know, you're, you're well known in the parkour community for things like the hell night um, uh, that you used to run, I think every Wednesday night, I think, uh, if I'm correct on that, um, but you used to do that once a, once a week. Um, you're well known for, you know, what most people, especially people outside the parkour world, what most people look at and go and, and just call crazy physical challenges um and and you did a lot of those alone you did a lot of training in your early days you was a lot, a lot of time it's just you solo training right which is also kind of a great thing in parkour but kind of rare um as well so most people train in small groups so you did a lot of stuff alone and you did a lot of super hard physical you know and mental challenges why do you think you were able to do that do you do you think do you think it's something that you grew up with do you think you were born with it do you think you learned it somewhere why do you think you were able to and, and why did you want to do those things and choose to do those things? Um, as opposed to most people would be like, man, uh, work's finished today. I'm going to go home and chill out. You were like, work's finished. I'm going out for four hours of horrible conditioning, you know, in the rain. Like, well, why, why did you choose that? Uh, I think I was um, lucky to realize early on that if I wanted to do this for a very long time, which I did, then I would have to prepare my body and get a lot stronger to sort of handle these impacts, handle these forces and um, just stay, have like a, have that armor, I guess, that would protect me for a long time. So I loved parkour. The only way that would be taken away from me is if I got seriously injured and couldn't do that sort of thing again. So how do I stop myself from getting injured? I get stronger. So there was a very sort of, it was a very quick sum in my head as to, I want to do this for a long time. How do I do that? Protect my body. So we'll go from there. Um, I also really enjoyed the aspect of understanding what I could do. And the only way to do that is to really push yourself to the limits and find out where those limits are. So I, I failed far more challenges than I've sort of overcome, I would say. I have failed so many challenges that I've written down and thought that sounds like a good idea. And it really wasn't a good idea. Or that should be easy. And it, it really, really wasn't easy. But you don't know that unless you go there. So if you know you can do this many pull ups or traverse this far, then if you are at height and you're looking at the, the possibility of being able to make it across to the other side somewhere, I had a very good understanding of I can definitely make that or that's about on my limit. So I think it gave me a lot of sort of knowledge um, that I could then apply to the technical challenges of parkour or the psychological challenges of parkour. Um, it gave me more insight into who I was, what I could do, and it pushed those boundaries a little bit further. So I enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it. And I enjoyed failing and trying to figure out why I failed was it because I quit or was it because I just reached my absolute physical limit? Um, did I drink enough water that day? So I enjoyed the kind of experiments there to figure out what went wrong and then being more intelligent as to planning the next challenges. And I think that's how I've been able to inject a lot of that into my coaching is because I understand 
roughly how these challenges work and develop and unfold. I think I've been able to apply a lot of that to how I teach group classes and one-to-one -one sessions and being able to analyze someone a little bit and figure out what number should I throw out there in the beginning? What's going to be way too many? What's going to be way too easy? And being able to kind of use my own experience then throw that out. So um, I don't know why I did so many of them. Um, most of my training, I'd still say, was done in very small groups, two or three people in, in Leicester. But during the week, most of the week, I'd spend the evenings training in Hinckley, in that small town. So there was nobody else. At that time, there was nobody else really training in that, in that area. It was just me. So I would train at home, or I'd go out and train for a few hours on my own um, every weeknight. And then on the weekends, I'd go to Leicester and train uh, with the guys. So um, I don't know why I did so many, but um, I think it was because it, I got a lot out of it, I would say. It taught me a lot about who I am and, and how to get better at parkour. And you've done a lot of those and I've you know I, I know you've done a lot of money you've come up with a lot of them uh, and most of them yeah most of them seem pretty stupid uh, and I've been there for, for quite a few of them um which, some of them were your ideas actually yeah yeah not that many but uh, but if you, if you um like if you think back to give people an idea because there may be people watching this who you know from a different generation who maybe never did those kind of challenges or whatever pick out one of those early challenges that you particularly remember um and explain what it was uh, and 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 why you chose it and kind of how you went through it was pick one out that you think that, that was a really good one i like that one uh probably one of the earlier ones was the 300 uh cat pass precisions or kong precisions you might know mm -hmm. them as um the idea was to try and do 300 of this particular movement in a row uh and not miss and that was the that was the challenge i think it was based on someone just someone passing by while we're training one day and saying like, one day you're going to miss that you know it made me think a little bit as to Will I? Maybe. Maybe I will. Maybe I won't. But um, it kind of made me explore the idea of if I approach each and every one of these reps with the same intent, attention to detail, um, and focus, and if I train the technique enough, maybe maybe I won't miss ever. Do you know what I mean? Obviously, there's a small percentage that you could just something could happen, the wall could break, or whatever it is, um, and you can't perfect something. But maybe I can get close enough that. I can I can get most of these like 99.9% .9 of the time I'm going to make these. So the challenge was set. It was 300. It was uh, if, any, if anyone's listening doesn't know what this is, you run up to a wall. Um, you put your hands on the wall, and your feet pass through the space where your hands were, and you land on an object on the other side. So it was two level walls like this. You would pass over this one, and you would land on this one, and the gap was maybe five or six feet, so just under two maybe just a little bit under two meters, I'd say. It wasn't too high, it wasn't that difficult, um, but the, the challenge there was do 300, and if you miss one, then you start again. Um, so 300 in a row was done, uh, and uh, I didn't miss one, thankfully. So I wasn't tested as to whether I would actually start again and stay there, but I, I, I know myself very well, and I know that, that in that particular case, I would have had to have been carried away from, from that wall. I'd have stayed there until, um, until it was done or until I couldn't stand up. So um, that was a good one. That was a fun that, one. Yeah, that's the key element to that one, right? Doing 300 cat pass precisions, you know, is it's still a lot and most of you are going to go, yeah, that's a lot. But the element that you add to that of, and if I miss one at any stage, even if it's 298, mm -hmm. I start again at zero. That's the element that is, that's the challenge in that, that in that drill, right? Absolutely. That's that's the psychological bit because past, past 30, past 50 reps, the pressure now is beginning to, every time you get it right, the pressure is beginning to mount as in like, if I miss one now, I have to go back and I've already done 200. So the closer you get to the end, the more the pressure builds. How do you manage that pressure? And that's the whole point of the challenge, I guess, is how do you manage that pressure? Um, and there's a lot of pressures in parkour when it comes to facing fears and overcoming adversity. So I think it was, I think that challenge and a lot of challenges, um, they teach you a lot about how to face those sort of pressures. And how do you deal with that psychological side of parkour, especially when that pressure is building with each and every rep? And as I was getting closer to the end, I started to realize that physically I was beginning to break down in some areas. So that if I had to start again now, it would be a much more difficult experience. So it was just a case of trying to walk back to the starting position, um, control as many variables as possible. So I had a small mark on the ground that I had memorized where a little bit of paint had been. I started there every single time. My run-up was exactly the same every time. I put my hands in the same place every time. And I'd try and control as many variables as I, as I could. That would remove some of the doubts from the equation. Um, and then I would just treat each one as if it was the first one. Uh, so if I have to start again, then I've only lost one rep. 
but that was the hardest part is convincing myself that um, I'm not at 260 right now. I'm at number one. And if this goes wrong, it's fine because I haven't lost very much. But certainly the last 10 reps, the last five reps, the last couple of reps were a little bit hairy. Um, but by that point, my body had taken over in a lot of ways. My brain had almost got to the point where it could just replicate the same output each time. So there was probably only a couple of moments where I could have missed one, as in I went slightly too far or just slightly too short. Um, but I think because of the way I trained back then, um, I was able to kind of correct and deal with that mm. before it became a problem, or either in the air slightly or upon landing. I was able to co sort of um, counteract any any forces that were too much in each way. So mm. yeah, it was a good one. That was a nice one. I mean, it, you know, it's it's a great challenge, and that and that that when you, when you think about it, the depth of um, the depth that's going on psychologically in that kind of challenge. It's a physical challenge, but really it's a psychological challenge. You know, the depth that's going on there in terms of staying in the moment, which is what you're talking about, right? I guess be, remaining imminent and being in the present moment, treating each one as V1, not as a, as number 273 or whatever. Um, and bringing your mind back to that present moment that, you know, that is, that's exceptionally profound stuff for a young guy to be experiencing, you know, monks in Zen, temples and monasteries and you know in in the far east and christian esoterics and, and whatever that you know the, the the old mysteries the old wisdoms they train for they train their whole lives meditating on those exact points um and it's pretty rare to find a discipline i think where you you actually explore that and experience that on a very very visceral level without anyone telling you you have to do it that's the interesting thing for me is that there are certain people like yourself who took that on themselves you know, no one, no one told them you got to do this as part of your initiation to understand the mysteries of the mind. <laughs> um, yeah. You were just like, mm, that, that's, that sounds like a good thing to do. And I kind of feel intuitively that it's a good thing, good way to train myself. Um, so I'm going to do it. Um, yeah. And that's quite interesting how that organically comes around. Mm. It is very interesting. And I think I learned that mindset through parkour itself. I think parkour taught me about that mindset and the benefits of being in the moment and the how much better your abilities can be if you can remain in the moment and not think about what's going to happen next or what just happened a moment ago. So even if you didn't manage something a moment ago, that was a moment ago and now it's, it's now. So you can, you can make a change and you can, you can do it well. And there's no point dwelling on that or worrying about the next one, just, just get this one right. And I think uh, that's also what got me through a lot of those physical challenges is it's not about doing the thousand muscle ups. It's about doing the next one. Um, and then once we've done that one, we'll, we'll have a little look at the, the one after that. So it's kind of, it's, it's, uh, it's that whole giant elephant that you're trying to eat and you just got to eat it one little bite at a time. Because um, if you focus on the whole thing, you're, you're just not going to get there. Um, so yeah, I think that's uh, something I learned through parkour, probably even just from the very early days of standing on a rail um, and trying to balance and stay, stay on, the, on that one small low railing. Um, it's, if you can just remain present, and, and focus on how you feel or the breeze or that little small ant walking on the rail next to you. If you can kind of focus on something that's happening now, then you're much more likely to stay on the rail. As soon as you start thinking about, oh, I'm going to have some dinner later on, it's going to be really good, you're off. Or if you worry about that jump you missed a few minutes ago, then you come off the rail as well. So it's a lesson in the benefits of staying present. Um, and I think that carried through all of my training from that point, so those early days forward. And I enjoyed finding challenges that would explore that further and um, force me to try and stay here and now um, as much as possible. And how has your training evolved? Like, do you still do that? Or is it, you know, how has your training changed from when you started to now? Let's say, what's the evolution been? And what do you think the most important elements of that evolution are? Uh, the, I guess the foundations are still similar in some ways. So my reasons for training probably have evolved and kind of changed and shaped themselves the way they have over the years. Um, in terms of training methodologies, I started off um, doing a lot of technical work and then it was a lot of physical work. And I never really went back to training a lot of technical stuff. So I'd say the ratio and the split between my physical training, and my technical training is probably 70% physical training. 30% technical training. It might even be more uh, sort of weight towards the physical side. And I don't really know why it just felt like the right thing to do. Um, touch wood, I've been relatively injury free throughout my, my whole practice. It's been 
seven, 17 years now. Um, and I've never really had any sort of serious injuries that have taken me out for a long time. And I largely believe that's down to uh, the way I trained in the early days. I could be much better technically now than I am if I had probably had a better ratio, but it's a ratio that worked for me. Um, and I enjoyed the physical side of parkour. I really enjoyed um, that approach. And I think it's good for each person to kind of choose their own ratios and how they want to train. Uh, and that was mine. So um, my training has always been weighted towards the physical side with some little technical flavor mixed in here and there. And I think the way I approach technical training um, allowed me to make quite a bit of development in a short amount of time. In terms of the amount of time that I dedicated to the technical side per month, let's say, uh, it wasn't that much, but the way I approached it perhaps gave me a bit of a step forwards um, at quite a quick pace somehow. So um, it's, it's evolved over the years. I do a lot more uh, lifting now. I do a lot more strength work uh, in a more intelligent manner. Mm. I do less challenges, I would say, that are a bit crazy because I think I've done a lot of those. I understand the lessons that I've learned from those. So I still do the occasional um, crazy challenge but they are a little bit more specific now and uh, things I'm just curious about as to what about this, what about that? And they're usually geared towards things that will try and keep me in the moment um, and not thinking about the big picture, but just thinking about the next thing. What's the next small thing I have to do to make this challenge um, a little bit easier on the whole, I guess. Now let's talk about teaching. Like, okay. you, started, you started coaching, um, what, 2010 maybe? I think it was two, I moved to London in 2009, uh, in January. So I think okay. 2008 was the rendezvous I attended, um, in London. And right. I think I moved down 2009, January, I think. Okay. So probably since then onwards, I've, uh, is when the coaching journey sort of began. Yeah. And that was, uh, I mean, you went straight into it. Obviously we threw you straight into it. Um, and, um, and you ended up, you know, teaching, pretty much every day for, for years and years and years. Um, and then eventually going on to teach other teachers doing coach education through ADAPT, you, you sort of ended up teaching parkour coaches around the world how to coach um, and then teaching at other events and crossing into different communities to teach them outside, you know, from outside parkour. So you, your, your experience of teaching is, you know, you're in a very, very, very small percentile at the top of the world in terms of teaching how much, your experience of teaching parkour, how much experience you have, or you have of that is, is huge. So um, when you teach now, what are, the, um, what are the kind of central pillars of your teaching that you're trying to pass on to people? Do you have that in mind or do you shape it to the individual? Or are there things that you think, you know what, I think these things should be passed on and in some way I want to get them across to these people? What are the central uh, pillars of your teaching? I think the central pillars of my teaching have evolved again over the years probably. They're a little bit more, um, maybe they're a little bit looser now. Maybe in the beginning as a, a less experienced coach, I would try and project my idea of parkour across to them. So my, my principles of parkour being sort of focused on the basics and not worry too much about the, like the other sides of parkour that may be less foundational and just uh, focus on control and really good quality and, and those sort of things. But that's, that's how I trained. So that's probably a good chance I projected a lot of that in the early days of my coaching. And I, I was a lot less able to read a student and figure out what it is. Why did they come here to this class? Did they come here because they saw on, on YouTube and wanted to do some cool stuff? Or have they read some of the philosophy and they really want to dive into that side? So I think as my training, as my coaching evolved, it became a lot more about the student and a lot less about me projecting my idea of parkour onto them. And I learned that lesson very quickly. I, I quickly realized that this isn't about me at all. This is about them. Um, and why are they here? What do they want? Because if it wasn't for structured coaching, they would find their own path through this anyway, which take a bit longer. So my job is to maybe give them a nice safe, um, safe boundaries to explore their own um, journey in parkour and then throw in a few questions or challenges or things along the way that will then just allow them to take that next step in the journey. So um, I guess I was setting up boundaries in some ways to allow them to grow in the direction they wanted to grow um, rather than projecting my idea of parkour onto them. That happened along the way um, as I became a more experienced coach. I realized the importance of that. But in terms of central pillars that really I, I think are, are really good for everyone, um, 
focusing a lot on the details is, is one of the big ones. So how you do something rather than what you do. I don't really mind the movements that you choose to do in parkour or how you pass that wall. But the sort of the foundational aspects of how is the landing? Is it quiet? Is it soft? Uh, was it done quickly? Was there any loss of momentum along the way? Did that repetition injure you in any way? Is there any sort of micro trauma that was caused because of the way you distributed your weight? So um, I guess it was my job then to look at the details of how they were moving um, and to take what they wanted to learn in some ways uh, and try and mesh those two worlds together. So they want to learn parkour, but they've got something in their head that they think parkour is. Um, I would still project my idea of parkour in some ways because that's, that's, that was me at that class. And if they, if they want to explore my way of training further, then I would be very open to, to pushing that as well. But I think if I had to summarize it, I would say that I tried to read the class, I tried to read the individual and read the group, um, figure out who they were and what they needed and how I could use my experience to give that to them. Um, it became more about them very quickly, which, which is obviously one of the, the foundations of coaching in general. It's not about you, it's about the students. So um, yeah, it evolved over time, same as my training. Mm-hmm. Um, but I try to find out what, what is their reason for training and go that path if I can. And what do you think is the, do you think that's the biggest danger um, of coaching is trying to force your way of doing something onto the learner? Or, or, or what do you think in terms of you, you've trained a lot of coaches, so you've seen a lot of probably, probably thousands of coaches. You've probably helped become coaches. So in your experience, what do you, what's the big kind of danger for new coaches? What's the thing they should all look out for? It's the safety side, I guess you, you have to mention because parkour is a risky practice um, and not everyone is naturally talented at it. So you might get a coach that comes in that really wants to coach and is super passionate, but they were naturally quite good at parkour from the beginning. So their journey to get to where they are, they didn't go through a lot of the uh, mistakes along the way. So they, they could perhaps assume that a student could do something that they could do at that, at that sort of stage of development. And maybe it's not true at all. So that's kind of safety aspect, I guess. Um, you see that slipping sometimes with new coaches. Uh, they get very excited about sharing this thing that's so um, important to them that they sometimes forget that not everyone can do the things they can do. So the safety side first, I guess, would be the big one. Uh, the other mistake is focusing too much on the movements. Like I've got to teach them this fall. I have to teach them this arm jump, this particular way of doing this thing, rather than saying, here is the obstacle. Let's look at how your body is built uh, your background, your training history, and figure out what is the best way for you to get from here to there or to overcome that challenge. So focusing too much on the movement and less on the idea that parkour is not about the individual movements. Um, it's about facing the challenges and overcoming them um, using your way rather than a kind of pre-prescribed way. Mm. So kind, of zooming in, kind of zooming out and keeping... Um keeping a big picture perspective in a way for in yeah. terms of you know rather than focusing too much on the detail of like teaching them these particular techniques and this checklist like you said earlier but mm-hmm. pulling out and pulling back and thinking it's con you know it's concepts it's principles it's exactly it's, that hmm. yeah it's much more that than it is to do with learning the cat bass um it's quite it's a good technique it's used by many people but um if you look at some people like uh Thomas, um thomas de bois um, he, he doesn't use that vault as much as everybody else does, but he will find a way to do the same and pass the same obstacle. And that's something I noticed quite early. It's just not his favorite movement, but um, he's damn good at parkour and he'll find a different way. If he doesn't want to do that, he'll find he'll use one arm or he'll jump over the first obstacle, whatever it is. Um, but you can't argue that he's, um, he's bad at parkour because he's, he's completely opposite. Um, so yeah, you, you don't need this checklist of movements. Um, all you've got to do is find your way of getting over this thing we're getting past this thing. Uh, that's good enough. If you can do it with those, with those qualities that we mentioned earlier, then that's your way of doing it. I'm a little worried that um, I, I myself have used the same, the very same analogy using Thomas <laughs> um, teaching courses as a demonstration of why you don't necessarily have to master a certain technique because Thomas okay. is not a cat pass. But either. So I'm a bit worried now that, that, that you and me have spread around the world this view that Thomas is crap at cat <laughs> Yeah, no, he is for sure. I've seen him try. 
Um, <laughs> he's probably watching and he's going to come for us. So he, no, he's uh, probably going to try. Yes. Yeah, we, ha- we haven't given his real name, so I guess it's all right. No one knows exactly. what talking about. So. Yeah. <laughs> his real name's Marcus, isn't it? I think yeah, Mar- Marcus Moreno or something like that. That's I can't um, anyway. <laughs> uh, But no, I completely agree, man. I think the, yeah, the concepts, getting them across, um, and it's something that one of the biggest errors that I see from 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 newer coaches and, and from even coaches that have been coaching a while is that is they, they focus so much on on trying to convey like the um, what they believe to be the sort of important details of the movements themselves and the techniques, which is true. And if you're into parkour, you will get really into that technical side of it. Mm-hmm. Um, but then when you see someone, you know, introducing a load of complete beginners to parkour by, by getting them to focus on a tiny, tiny, tiny um, precision jump detail on a curb, you think, are you narrowing that person's vision too much? You know, you, you, surely you should want them to experience what made you fall in love with parkour when you were, when you started and what made you fall in love with it was not doing a small technical jump to a curb. Probably it was the idea of freedom and the idea of exploration and the idea of challenge and um, the idea of that you could use this space in a completely different way and just play the, exactly. those concepts where you have to get across the people. First of all, those are the things that are important to get across and then the detail and the technical stuff. Yes. But I want them to go away from their early sessions with that feeling. Um, Because that's what will keep them motivated, keep them coming back. And they can learn the technical stuff over time. Exactly. You need to go big picture first. You've got to do the outlines of the jigsaw. And then they can fill in the middle parts themselves with the details that they they wish. They can make their own picture in the middle of that jigsaw. Um, And you should don't think you should project your jigsaw onto them. It's up to them to find out how those pieces fit into place and how um, they want to move through that space to then experience that freedom and that um, capacity, I guess. Hmm. Yeah, no, that's a really jigsaw analogy. That's a really nice way of looking at it. I'm probably going to steal that one now and use it myself in the course. I've stolen many things from you. So um, <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a good one. Um, and all coaches just, you know, all coaches should steal stuff from other coaches all the time. We, ha- we 100% endorse that. So any coaches watching, please steal that idea as well um, and use it in your, in your own sessions. Um, so I got a question from, um, from, from Bo, which, uh, you know, maybe you covered a bit, but just, uh, you know, you, you talked about in the early days, but um, Bo asked, what motivates you when it comes to coaching? Um, so, and does the way you coach reflect how you train? So what motivates you now when it comes to coaching? Uh, I think it's just to try and, I, I've made a lot of mistakes along the way in, in my training journey. Um, it's just a case of not, it's not, not putting them in a position where they're not going to make their own mistakes, but just to give them a little bit of guidance perhaps as to things they, they really shouldn't do. So for example, don't completely ignore um, weightlifting because you've just closed that door and thought this is, this is useless, uh, for example. Um, so if, if, if someone comes to me as a student with that sort of mindset, I can, I can have an opportunity now to say to them, I had the same experience. Uh, I had the same mindset in the beginning and actually I opened that door and I made a lot of progress. So um, I guess being able to assist people along the way is one of my motivations now. I don't want to give them shortcuts. Um, I would like them to become much better than I am at parkour, but I, I want them, I don't want, if I could give them a magic key and say, just open that door and walk through and you're going to be this good. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it. They have to take all those little steps along the way. So they come to a coach probably for a shortcut and for a safe passage to good parkour. Um, but in terms of what motivates me to coach them now, I guess it's also just sharing the joy of parkour in a lot of ways. It's given me so much and it's made me who I am today in many, many ways. I was a boy when I started, I was 17 and I think I became uh, an adult mostly um, through practicing parkour. So uh if it has helped to shape me so much, I think it can help other people in many ways. I've seen it help people with depression. I've seen it um, help people who were struggling in parts of their life and use that tool to then pull through and use the lessons they've learned in parkour to apply elsewhere in their lives. Um, And I think it's a very powerful tool in that way. So if I can pass on a little bit of that and get that across, then um, that's a good day, I would say. And can you ever envisage a day that you stop training in parkour? Uh, No. No, I, will, I don't think I'll ever stop training in parkour because I might change the way I train parkour or the frequency um, and the amount of time I spend doing it in, in relation to other... I'll never stop training, but the amount that I train parkour specifically might vary throughout the years. So, for example, the last two to three years, I haven't done very much parkour at all. Um, but I think about it every day. I can't switch that off. 
um, and the times that I do spend training parkour, I realize that not much has changed uh, because of the physical training that I keep doing and the way I think about parkour. I think it's one of those very weird things you can get better at just by thinking about it, mm. just by internalizing how you feel about a certain jump. You can actually make some progress with it and rationalize certain aspects that you might find very scary. So the next time you go there, even if you haven't done any physical training, you might have unlocked something in your head that allows you to do that. Mm. So it's been really interesting as an experiment almost to go back. And when I have trained, haven't taken maybe a few weeks off here and there, of just technical training to just have a day or an afternoon or even a moment where I'm like, I'm going to look at this jump and see how I feel. It's still there. Mm. Great. And it's a nice reminder that all that training I have done doesn't go away. It doesn't fade very quickly at all. So when you spend 15, of your, 15 years of your life doing something, if you have two years where you kind of focus elsewhere or two or three years you focus elsewhere, it's nice to know that that doesn't just fade away and disappear. Uh, a lot of those lessons I think I've kept now for life and hopefully they'll stay with me forever. Yeah. I think that's a really interesting aspect of, of being human, right? I mean, yeah, I remember Johan Vigru talking about a similar thing many years ago when we were chatting about training and, and Johan is obviously one of the great early practitioners, you know, and, um, I, and I remember him saying that, you know, there were, there were periods, I asked him, like, did he ever stop training? And he said, yeah, there's, you know, I'll, I'll take a few weeks when I don't do any training, no parkour. And I was like, really? You know, you're one of the original yep. French, you know, legends or whatever. And he said, yeah, man. And he said, you won't, you won't get any, you won't get any worse. And, and sometimes just by thinking about stuff and letting, letting your body heal from the little niggles, but you're still, you're still playing all those jumps out in your head. When you come back, you're actually better technically yep. um, for having done the happen. break. Um, and you know, that's, I think it's a really interesting thing for people to understand because that can help mitigate the, the overtraining um, you know, phenomenon that happens in parkour. A lot of people, they train too much and they, and they break themselves, you know, they break their body down too much. And, um, and it's cause they think I must be, unless I'm training, I'm not getting better. But the reality is that the way the human body and brain works is you can take these breaks and it might actually improve your technical skill. Yeah, I completely agree with that. Uh, I think that those breaks are important to um, reflect on the journey you've had so far and how you want to change things going forwards. And if something is a lifelong practice for you, then there's, there's no harm in taking a couple of weeks off or a couple of months or a year or more because it's a lifelong practice. So you'll go away, you'll learn some new things and you'll be able to apply what you've learned elsewhere back to the discipline um, and it will change the way you approach it and it will change the things that matter to you in that discipline. So um, I'm not worried at all about losing anything because in terms of capacity or ability, because from what I've seen, um, nothing fades that quickly at all. When I have had those moments where I've tried something or gone out with you for a few hours or somebody else, it just seems to click back into place and you flick that switch. And a lot of the time, it's just a case of making that mental switch of I'm going to commit to this and my experience will take care of me here. Have you seen the... Does, um... Uh, I know you've seen it. You've, you've seen The Last Dance, the documentary with, uh, right. yeah, with Michael Jordan. It's, I mean, that's a prime example of it, right? In that he he does basketball you know, forever, yep. wins everything, and then stops, goes and plays um, baseball for, was it two years? Uh, probably. Maybe it was about that. Something like that. 18 months, two years. He went, so he didn't do it. It was anything. at least a year. It was at least a year went off, played a completely different sport, came back to basketball. And I remember there was like one training session where he was a bit rusty and he, and they kind of, he lost in the training session in the, in the, in the sort of practice game. Yeah. And then the next training session, the next week, he was like back hundred percent back, that's it. you know, crushed that's everything. Yeah, there was a one game. That's it. One game where he was rusty and you could see he was rusty. He was missing baskets. And yeah. then the next game, he just destroyed everyone. I think so, someone looked at him and said, good game, Mike. Was, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Was game um, over. <laughs> and, and that's you know that's 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 proof right there that you know he he spent two years out and within and maybe he's maybe jordan is special but within you know within a within a, a week or two he turned it around and got back to his original level um yeah. and hadn't clearly hadn't lost anything exactly um, yes i think the human body uses a lot of resources to learn uh, new skills and build capacities uh whether they're movement capacities or, or strength so it doesn't make any sense to lose them quickly um, because you've spent so many resources and time and energy uh, building them that they're kind of entrenched and, and used going forwards. So if you have someone at the sort of wrestling in high school who then stops and takes a good few years off and gets into a fight later in life, probably the first thing they're going to resort to is some of those movements they thought they were practicing in high school because it's still there. They still practice them. Um, 
So I, I really look at, look at it as a, as a lifelong practice. Um, I completely agree with Johan, not just on that, but on many things. He's a very smart man. Um, <laughs> Uh, big him up, man. We can have him on the show. Don't big him up. Yeah, we're picking up all these French guys. It's great. <laughs> um, Chris Grant, he's trained with the French guys. You can ask him. Um, but yeah, I think in a lot of ways, it's, you can take a few weeks off. You can take a few months off. Um, you can take years off. And if, you've, if the way you've trained has been uh, intelligent, well thought out, and kind of systematic in some ways, it's not going to go anywhere. It's, it's going to be with you forever. Mm. So um, I, I'm not worried about that at all. And what do you do? This is a question from Roberto, which ties into this, you know, in terms of he's talking about training for life and that, but there, there must be days where your motivation isn't quite there. You go out to train, your motivation is, isn't quite there. It's not quite, it was not quite what it normally is. You know, maybe it's 10% low or whatever. You don't feel it today, you know, whatever. Um, and, you know, I'm going to, maybe you're just going to start with something because um, you enjoyed it much and, and, and I'm going to just go from there. How do, how do you, what do you do? What's your practice like when your motivation is low? How do you start that training session? Cool. So first of all, hi to Bo and thank you for the last question because I forgot to say that. And uh, thank you, Roberta, for your question. Um, there are definitely days, there are many days where the motivation is quite low and I don't feel like training or I'm just more sore than usual or something's a bit off. Uh, and I usually at that point have a bit of a bargain with myself as, as to say something along the lines of, okay, I'm going to go out and just warm up and do this very small thing. And if I feel, if at that point I feel like coming home, then I'll come home. No problem. But without fail, that's never happened. It's always been, okay, that's the bargain, but let's do it. We go out, we warm up, we do the small thing. And whilst doing the small thing, we notice the next small thing. And at that point, you're warm, your training is there. So the hardest part is getting out the house sometimes or just going to training. Um, I really believe in just showing up. That's, that's a huge part of making progress um, because once you show up, you can then switch on all the, the dials and get them all going and, uh, before you know it, you're having a great session. Some of the best sessions I think I've ever had have been unplanned. They've been days where I felt lazy, days where I felt unmotivated. And I've gone out, I've done the bare minimum of warming up, doing one small thing. And suddenly that's taken off and three, four hours later, I'm doing something that I haven't done before. So I think the biggest battle sometimes is getting off the sofa, getting out and starting. Um, at least make that deal with yourself. Um, and if you get out and do the warm up and you want to come home, come home. Maybe it's not the not a good day for training. You need rest days. But um, think about why you want to train. Think about big picture. If you do this small session today, does that take you a half step towards your goal? It probably will. So um, yeah, try that approach. It might it might help. It definitely helps with me uh, if I feel unmotivated or uh, a bit down on that at that point. So give it a try. It might work. I hope it does. <laughs> yeah so a bit of, a bit of discipline a bit of kind of yeah making a deal with yourself mm -hmm. and then understanding that um it's okay it's also okay if you make that deal with yourself and you go out and you and you still feel like no i'm going to come back then it's yeah. okay it's okay to, i mean you've got to have the discipline but it's okay to it's okay to say no sometimes as well it's good to say no yeah i've seen a lot of people it's never happened to me yet i've seen a lot of people that have said okay i'm finished training for the day and then the, on the way out, they kind of get sidelined towards something. And they're like, oh, let me just try this. And, and it doesn't always go to plan. That's usually when people get injured or things happen. So listen to your body. It's trying to tell you things. Um, it's very intelligent. So uh, it might be giving you little clues here and there as to when it's time to have an easy day. You know? Talking about easy days, we, I, I know you've got a birthday coming up. So, you know, you're, you're getting older. We've got a couple of questions about, um, about uh, age mm -hmm. and training. Um, so. And, and also about, um, you know, you being a father. One interesting question we had um, from uh, Jonas is, when you became a father, did that change your approach to training in any way? Good question, Jonas. Um, did it change my approach to training? I think it perhaps changed my reasons for training in some ways. Uh, when you're responsible for someone who completely relies on on, on you and their mother for protection and safety and for you to always be there. Um, I think it does change the way you think about training. Um, <clears throat> I think it definitely changed my perspective around certain aspects of training, perhaps like things like maybe training at height or things like the amount of time I spend training away from home, uh, those sort of things. So maybe it made me reflect on being less selfish, I guess, in some ways. 
of not just going out for five, six hours and training for me and having this real burning fire to get better for not selfish reasons, perhaps, but for me, first and foremost. And it definitely made me think more big picture as to how can I use this tool that we talked about before, which is parkour in this case, to become a better father or to set a good example for my daughter or whatever it might be. So um, I think it's changed things. If you looked at it from the outside, I don't think you would see a difference in how I trained. If you just watched me train every day, there wouldn't be a, a stick in the ground where hmm. before this point, you trained this way, after this point, you trained this way. But there are some shifts inside that I feel. Uh, maybe my motivation for training and my, my passion for being fit and healthy and strong for a very long time um, to be able to look after my family. I think that's also become more at the forefront of my training and my reasons for training now. Um, I think it's changed me for sure. I think it's changed my training, but it's more the internal changes rather than the way I practice from an outside mm. perspective, I would say. Mm. And, uh, you know, following on from, from that in terms of, in terms of getting older from an, from an individual point of view, you know, your um, uh, as Samuel asks, your uh, Trasso has always shown movement that's based on quite high physical competence. You know, your videos are full of really powerful, explosive movements, a lot of strength, a lot of control. Um, how are you planning to manage your personal goals while you get older, understanding that your performance, you know, may probably inevitably um, in time will will sort of decrease? How how are you planning to manage that psychologically and 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 manage your training goals uh, hello samuel i hope you're doing well uh well first of all i'm going to use you because you're 10 years older than me so i'm going to look at your <laughs> Shit, man, inevitable decline and i'm gonna when you go left and it doesn't work out i'm gonna go right <laughs> that's what i'm gonna do <laughs> so, <laughs> no, um, i'm doing that to stefan so it's okay i'm just following no, his cool. lead because he's, okay. he's he's aging faster than we're I following him man we're, we're yeah. deep shit so <laughs> Can we swear on this? I don't even know. But, um, uh, I think we just did. It's done. It is done. You're good. Yeah. Uh, what was the question? Sorry, Samuel. Um, yeah. Okay, cool. So, um, yes, I'm going to be 34 uh, next week. Um, that still sounds very young to me, um, especially compared to yourself, Dan. Thank but, you. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I don't feel 34. Um, and I think in a lot of ways... I'm still progressing. I'm still feeling very healthy. I still feel like I'm getting stronger and, and better in a lot of ways. So I don't feel that approaching decline just yet. Uh, and I also have a lot of role models, um, friends of mine who are older than me and who are kicking ass and are stronger and faster and more powerful than me. So that I'm surrounded by a lot of people that I can see are in more advanced years than I am who don't even think about this stuff. And that's kind of my approach to it in some ways as well. I'm either dead or I'm alive. And if I'm alive, I'm going to train. And if I'm going to train, I'm going to approach it in a certain way. So um, I don't mind the fact that 20 years from now, 30 years from now, there will be a shift and maybe things will start to change slightly. I'll deal with it one day at a time. And as we said about eating that giant elephant, I'll take it one bite at a time. So if I need to drop off a few kilos on the weighted chins or on the deadlifts, or I've got to change the amount that I rest in between training sessions, I'll cross those bridges as I, as I get there. Um, and I'm excited to see sort of the other things I can explore. A lot, of, a lot of endurance athletes, for example, they get better as they get older. And there's a lot of sports where the athletes are that little bit older at their, at their peak. So maybe it'll be a shift towards maybe more endurance-based stuff or my suspicion is I'm just gonna listen to my body and see where it takes me. Um, I think you can practice parkour to some level as long as you wish. Mm. And it would just be a case of listening to the body one, one day at a time and, and, and going from there. So was there an aspect of that question I, I didn't cover? Cause I went off on a bit of a tangent. Uh, no, I mean, I think that's good. And, and it ties back to your, it ties back to the, um, you know, your, your original uh, training methodology in a way, which is, which was quite organic back in the day um, as all of our training was back then in terms of just, feeling what was right for your body on that particular day, feeling what challenges you wanted to do and following them. There wasn't so much planning. There wasn't so much programming back then, I suppose. Um, there was kind of a, a, an element of program development tied into the nature of the challenges in terms of many, many repetitions, thousand jumps or 300 cat passes. But the actual 
you know, very, very few people in the early days of parkour sort of mapped out a program of like six months and this is how I'm going to develop. So, um, well, we've had one interesting question, um, you know, about that. If, if you are injured, say you get injured or, you know, you're sick or you, or you encounter a setback in your training, um, uh, do you now, do you map a pathway in your practice? Do you create like a program to rehabilitate yourself or to get over that plateau? Um, or do you follow a more organic, uh, approach still uh, that's a good question i think uh, I, I try and use both in some ways uh, i'm a big believer in your body being quite intelligent and that you can work your way through some of these pro problems by feeling it out and feeling what well, does this feel good for the injured area does this cause me any more pain no okay let's let's keep doing it and see if we can just push a little bit in that direction as well as taking a bigger picture and thinking okay i'm injured in this area so maybe i shouldn't jump for a little while but I've got all these other areas that I'm interested in that I want to get better at. I want to get a better climb up. I want to work on my, my arm jumps, my dinos, my lashes, whatever it might be. So I'm going to spend this time as an opportunity to actually get better at those. So I, I try and look at all injuries in that sort of way as to, it's, it's not a limitation. It's actually, it's giving you a very clear answer as to this is what you should be training right now. And often that's the most confusing thing as to, there's all these things to train and to try and get better at. But if you've been given, given a very clear answer as to you can't do this, suddenly it's quite clear and it's actually quite easy to then say i'm going to train this so if it's a lower body body injury let's say it's both knees gone um then the obvious solution is you're going to be training your upper body for quite a while um but i think to answer the question it would be it'd be a bit of both there'd be some sitting down with a notepad figuring out what's the what's the ultimate goal here it's probably getting back to full capacity pain-free injury-free you based on my information uh my my experience and my knowledge and based on speaking to my friends um who understand this area better than i do or some physiotherapist whoever it might be you take all that information make a plan take that plan to somebody else and see if it works for them too in terms of does it make logical sense and also then following that plan does it feel right along the way because if you take the first few steps and it doesn't feel right the area is actually quite sore don't just follow that plan all the way to the end take a quick break there reanalyze things, prioritize, and, and, and move forwards, maybe in a slightly different direction. Uh, so I would use both. That's my answer to that. Cool. Um, and uh, along the same kind of theme, um, Rodrigo asked a question, as someone who also has a child and a demanding job, um, how do you manage the motivation and energy to train and find the time to train while balancing work, you know, with the fire brigade, with everything else, with your family, with rest and other activities. So how, how do you manage to, to fit it all in? Um, do you manage to fit it all in? Hi, Rodrigo. Um, good to hear from you. Yes, I, I do manage to fit it all in. Um, and it's because I make it a, it's a necessity, it's a priority. I have to train as well as I have to eat, I have to sleep, and I have to look after my family. So it, it's not an option for me um, because I know that with the training comes a lot of benefits and it's something that I love to do. So I'm going to do it um, the same way as I'm going to eat tomorrow when I wake up. Um, I'm going to train tomorrow in some, in some way. So uh, I think it was just, it's just making a conscious decision of deciding I train and that's something I do. Um, so I'm going to have to make that happen. If that means getting an hour's less sleep um, and waking up an hour early, then I'm going to do that. If I have to do a little bit during my lunch break and a little bit after my child goes to sleep, and a little bit tomorrow morning before my wife wakes up or husband wakes up, whatever it is for you, then I'm going to do it. So it's about prioritizing and you find time in your day to eat and hopefully to sleep. So you can find time to train. And some of the busiest people in the world have the same amount of time per day as you. Uh, and they, they, they do a lot more than I do with their day. They just break it down into a very well-managed schedule. So um, I think it's just a case of setting the priorities for you and figuring out what do you have to do for you to be happy and healthy and then how do i remove the i swear again the bullshit you don't need um to make space for the stuff that you do need so if that means removing a little bit of tv time or removing a little bit of uh, a meeting that you can push to maybe the end of another meeting rather than having two separate days i think there's ways of organizing your week prioritizing your time um and having small sacrifices to to fit it in if it's important to you, I think. All right. My, uh, you know, I want to I delve a little bit more into that use of time. So um, 
I'm sure you've heard of like the the 80 20 rule in in terms of skill acquisition and things like that in in terms of the idea that you can um pro probably 20 in any discipline in any practice in life probably 20 percent of the training in that discipline is is responsible for 80 percent of the gains like you know the the other 80 percent is probably a lot of it is kind of you could do without it it's kind of fluff maybe you know um maybe it tweaks and adds adds um adds a little bit of panache or whatever to what you're doing but yeah. there's there's 20 percent of any discipline in which is like this is the key stuff and if you practice this stuff you will get pretty competent at it um yeah that that some people think that's a that's a really interesting way to to think about something to to to, to maximize your time to think find out what's the 20 percent, what are the key elements of that thing and i'm just going to train those things so if if someone said to you what are what's the 20 percent in parkour um you know what should i say one of those guys tim ferris or someone like that comes along and he says look i want to learn parkour what's the 20 percent that i need to be training what would you say in terms of technical approach or just across the board, everything? Just, just in terms of, in, he, he doesn't give you any more information than that. He just says, parkour, I don't know much about it, but I know you're an expert. I know you're you know, well, well known, well loved, um, and I respect your opinion. What is, what's the 20% that I should focus on in order to get good at parkour? What do you, what do you, it's a tough question as a coach. I know you're going to yep. want to load, you want to, you want to know, load more parameters, but, um, but that's, that's just the way it is. Yeah. Um, I'd probably say find things that scare you. Um, figure out why they scare you and break it down and stay with it until you are no longer afraid of it um, as, as part of that 20%. Let's say that's 5% because right. just by identifying those things that you would naturally want to avoid most of the time, you'll probably jump straight into that 20%. That's where you should be. You should be doing things that scare you just a little bit, that force you to be a little bit brave to, to tackle them. Um, and if you're scared of something, it's kind of giving you that little warning sign that this is where you should be. This is where you need development and this is where you have to focus because something's missing here. So I would say always approach it with, with that in mind, first of all, that's maybe like 5%. Um, muscle ups, 5% for sure. Um, the remaining 10%. Whole 5% on muscle ups. I'm gonna, yeah. Uh, I'll, get, I'll give a whole 5% to that unique person in terms of what they uh, are, are interested in. And the other 5% you could make up with just the, the capacities around being, having good balance, being accurate with your landings, being soft with your landings, um, and building your body as a whole and realizing that maybe parkour is not a complete training system. Maybe it needs a bigger worldview to supplement it, it a little bit with things like weightlifting perhaps or whatever it might be, just to kind of fill in the blanks in some ways. It's very easy to get distracted and drawn into the world of parkour and to put the blinders on and that's all you can see. Mm -hmm. But um, it's a very young practice. It's, it's 30, 40 years old and it doesn't have all the answers. We don't have all the answers yet. So um, be open to, to other things. Um, yeah, I would probably say that's 20% in some ways. If you can stick with things that scare you, you'll cover a lot of ground. I, I really love that the, the first five percent is yeah go towards the things that scare you. I think that's a really not only psychologically is that useful, but the reason you're afraid of those things is going to be tied in to your physical capacities and your physical needs. So that alone as a guide will probably lead you towards the things you need to fill in the gaps of your own self. Because the eighty percent stuff the or the ninety five stuff percent stuff that you're not afraid of probably you're pretty okay at that and you're probably going to get okay at that one way or another if you go out and train and move yeah um so that five percent yeah that's a really good way of looking at it because that five percent is probably the missing it's kind of the missing piece of the puzzle that if you unlock that piece of the puzzle you become a more complete athlete yes. a more complete version of yourself and therefore your progress is going to skyrocket rather than being held back by that 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 five percent that isn't unlocked yeah and the important thing is that that, that 5% will always shift. At some point, that won't be the thing that scares you the most. And when that shifts, you need to have a, a reassessment and realize, now it's this. I've made some progress here, but now it's this. And then go towards that. So it's a constant uh, analysis of, of what it is that scares you slightly. And then a, an intelligent approach to, to dealing with that and putting it in its place, I think. And, and how do you help people... So, I mean, I, you know, you, you know, obviously I agree on this front and that we, we agree that you should introduce people to fear kind of early on in parkour or, or rather 
if you introduce them properly to parkour, they will encounter fear early on, one way or the other. Um, and, and we believe that's a healthy thing. But, you know, a lot of people have a lot of difficulty dealing with it. How do you, as a, as a, in your experience, what's your method for helping people um, embrace their fear, stay with it, and, and learn to manage it? I think it helps in the beginning to remind them that it's not something to be ashamed of. Um, I, I'm scared of so many things. But it doesn't mean that I don't do them. It just means that it's giving me that little warning bell of, I have to be careful here for some reason because maybe I'm lacking something that would protect me here or whatever it might be. So I think it's the, the society as a whole is a little bit ashamed of being scared of stuff and they go to the other extreme of kind of having a bit of bravado there or um, hiding from it perhaps. So it's just a case of, of trying to build an environment in that class, whether it's indoors or outdoors, that being scared here is okay. I'm scared of this over there and I'm scared of this over there. Um, I don't have to run away from it. And it's something that I'm dealing with and what you're scared of will seem like a really big deal to you and it won't feel like that to that person over there. So it's, I think it's about trying to create an environment where positive learning can happen. Setting the tone of the class as something of kind of not accepting um, anyone who's going to be um, shaming people that are afraid of stuff. So setting kind of almost clear guidelines at the beginning as this is a safe space and we're going to be exploring some emotions here that we don't normally explore every day. Uh, and I think if you can set that out, as, as your boundaries and, and almost be open to, okay, I've been training for this long, but I'm still scared of this. Then people are maybe a little bit more open to um, telling you a little bit what, uh, 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 telling you more about what they're scared of, or at least um, not being so defensive when you discover it and you notice it and you bring it up. Mm -hmm. So I think it starts with creating a safe space where they feel like they can be themselves um, and then setting those boundaries and enforcing them along the way. Mm -hmm. You've got to, you to stay relatable as a, as a teacher. Yes. Yeah. I think it's, it's essential that they see the, the, the flaws that they feel they have, you still have, even after having practiced this thing for that long. Um, a lot of practices and a lot of disciplines and a lot of classes you can go to, it's quite rare to confront fear so directly and so head on and for it to be a topic of conversation, uh, apart from maybe the fighting arts and some other things, but um, it's at the forefront of a lot of parkour training. And I think people don't expect it when they come in the doors or they, or they meet you at the, at the station. But um, once they get over that first hurdle and realize that I'm scared and no one seems to be mocking me for that, it's okay to be scared here. And what I should be focusing on is the scary thing. Then if they come back next week, then uh, that's a little bit of progress. It's a little bit of progress there. It's a good sign if they come back after having faced a little bit of fear. You know? when, were you, when were you most afraid in your parkour training? What was that most afraid? What's the thing that scared you the most? Um, it might have been an underlying fear of injury, perhaps, at one point. Of what happens if this happens? Uh, what happens if I can't ever train again? I think there was times early on in my training where I wouldn't have been able to accept that very easily. That was probably a fear. Um, I think I've dealt with that a bit now, is that if, if, if my leg was removed tomorrow, then I would find a workaround it wouldn't be <laughs> as, as as bad as it maybe i thought it would have been 10 years ago i don't know what i was most afraid of in the last 17 years to be honest um Can't maybe failing a... failing as a coach perhaps it's definitely a fear of building a safe environment and then that environment sort of not being what you expect or someone getting injured in your class then maybe it was your fault but the fear of that is, is probably a real thing as well but it's probably more related to coaching than my personal experiences because if something is too scary for me, then I'll just take a small step back and I'll, I'll reassess it and I'll approach it again. And uh, I don't feel the need to push things that are so scary for me that it's going to affect my ability to do it safely. So I use that fear as a bit of a, a tool to tell me that it's time to pay attention. But if the fear is too great uh, and the risk is too high, I'm not going to do it anyway. So um the fear is obviously built on certain challenges, but at a certain point, I will take a small step back, reassess, go from there. I won't let it just keep building to the point where um, it's a danger to myself. You know? did, you, did you learn that? Were you taught it or did, you, did that just arise organically through your training? Like before, was there a time when you couldn't do that and you did stupid shit that you weren't ready for? <laughs> I think it's built organically in terms of early days. When you look at something, if you feel no fear for it, then you probably can't do it. Uh, in terms of it's not possible for you to do. So if you look at a massive running jump that you cannot physically make, you experience no fear towards that challenge because there's no part of you 
that's going to run along that wall and push. Mm. So that it's nothing to be scared of. Uh, what, what are, things become very interesting when you are a bit scared, because at that point, there's a part of you that knows I might do this or I might attempt this. And that's when the fear starts to build. So at that point, a part of you thinks this is possible. Then all the conversations and the approach starts. But if immediately that fear level was through the roof, if it was 10 out of 10 fear, that would be a warning sign to me that I probably can't do this, but a part of me wants to go for it. So it would take it beyond what I was thinking about to like the next level. And I would take a step back. So there's kind of this probably three zones, I would say there. There's, I'm not scared of this. Either it's way too easy for me, um, or I just can't do it. I'm a bit scared, which is probably what I should be focusing on. That's part of my 20%. It's five of the 20% alongside my slums. Um, and then there's the other side of it where I'm way too scared. This is going to be affecting my motor skills and my ability here. So I'm going to take a small step back. I'm not going to get injured. And I'll think about it a different way. Hmm. Again, of the, 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 the positive use of fear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really cool, man. Super powerful. Um, let's step back from that and just um, I, I want to get your views on the current state of parkour in the community worldwide and the situation you know it's uh, it's in um, and where it's you know, how it's evolved from when you began. So obviously, parkour is in a very different place now um, from when we started training. Um, uh, what do you think in terms of you know what what do you make of the parkour community these days and the parkour scene worldwide? What what do you think of the challenges it faces? Um, do you think it's going in a, a good direction? Do you think it, it do you think it's inevitable the direction it's gone in? Do you think it matters? What's your what's your general view of the parkour community now? I think overall, there are enough good practitioners that um, it, it's in safe hands in a lot of ways. There are, there are enough good practitioners who know what they're doing out there that if a student starts today, they will be able to find them if they spend some time looking. So there are situations where a lot of gymnastics organizations are kind of encroaching on the parkour practice in a country, um, which is awful in a lot of ways um, because parkour is not gymnastics. Um, but there are enough good parkour practitioners in those communities that at least if that's the choice, going through, going to parkour classes through gymnastics or going to parkour classes by parkour people. Um, if you gave both a fair shot and you looked at both, you would go to the parkour people. So, um, even though there's a lot of drama going on in that respect in some, some, some communities and some countries, I think as long as there's a strong enough community in place offering alternatives, then that is the that's kind of the counterbalance that's in place to, to to fix that in some ways, and it's an ongoing battle to try and reclaim a lot of that. Um, I guess stuff that gymnastics has stolen, but um, I think it's a it's it's one that's as long as you're doing good things in your parkour community, then you're offering that alternative and it's there. So Sweden's a good example that's happened quite a lot from what I've spoken to the guys over there, um, but they offer an excellent parkour training school so um i think anyone coming into it would look at that and say i'm going with the parkour guys um so i think overall broad picture i think parkour is in a good place i think it's in a in a, in a healthy place and if you told me this is where it's going to be in 17 years time when i started i would say okay that's not too bad it could have been a lot worse it could have gone somewhere very different um and i think that's largely down to the practitioners i've met a lot of people over the years uh, on my travels and I've met great people in every single community that I've gone to. And as long as those great people exist and as long as they um, teach parkour as they understand it and they experienced it and they learned it and their students go on to do the same thing, then I believe it's in safe hands. And there will always be those options available for people that want to get into it and are looking for that kind of authentic, raw uh, approach to parkour, how it was back in the day. Hmm. And probably the final sort of um, area, the quick final question that I want to uh, get to um, is what are your, you know, you've been training a long time. You've seen a lot, as we discussed before we went live, you know, we, we, we've been all over the world. I've been on the, a lot of those trips with you. So I, I've kind of seen the experiences you've had and you've done countless others, obviously. Um, so you've had a huge amount of experience. Um, parkour has, has allowed you and enabled you in a way to, 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 to do all that and to middle these people. And um, it's been a huge element, a huge aspect of your life. So big that we've, as we were discussing, we've, you tend to forget like probably 90% of the experiences you have, right? So 
what what are the big what are the most important learnings that you take out of your 17 years of training um and your 17 years of experience in this discipline what are the what what are the what are the things you've learned that are most important to you you think um it's been it's been a long time i've been practicing parkour uh, and i've learned a lot of lessons along the way but i think uh you, you kind of don't know whether your view of it is small and it's just local to you and your area um and it's not until you start traveling that you realize that the communities worldwide are largely on the same trajectory they might be in a different place on the trajectory they might still be arguing over parkour versus free running <laughs> Um, God, or they might be at the point where they're having the gymnastics conversation. Um, but there's this sort of curve and they're going to be somewhere on that curve. Um, so it's, it's really nice to see that wherever you go, um, the same people exist in every community and the same things are being discussed and they think that they're passionate about the same sort of things. So it kind of makes you traveling definitely makes you appreciate, um, your, your position and, how your community is developing and changing and, and kind of growing. Um, and the biggest things I've learned along the way, probably that uh, is, I think we always want to be better people in our lives. Uh, parkour is one way of doing that. And because you're in a practice that revolves around becoming a better person in many ways, you're going to make some amazing friends along the way. So um, I've met people through this, through this practice and through this, these years, that uh, are like family to me. And um, there's probably other ways of getting that same sort of experience through other sports or practices, whatever it is, but parkour was my way of finding these people and creating those human connections. Um, and I think the biggest lesson I've learned is kind of that we're all the same, even if we don't speak the same language, um, which has happened many times. I've taught seminars where no one spoke a word that, was, that could match up, but we made it work because parkour was our common language. Um, so we're all the same. Um, and the same things matter to everyone. They want to be a good person. They want to be able to look after themselves and look after the people they care about, that they love about, that they love. And they want to explore this world and explore their lives and figure out answers to things and um, be on kind of a, a never ending quest about getting better. So uh, it's been nice to, to learn those lessons through the parkour lens, I guess, and see it that way because people will see it different ways throughout their life. But, um, yeah, I think the biggest lesson really, the biggest takeaway for me is that we are all the same and our, the things that we have in common are far more important than the differences that we have. So we should focus on that, I think. Mm. All right, that's very powerful stuff there, Endo, man. It's pretty tricky. To, <laughs> pretty tricky to, that was um, a really big question, Dan. Why did you leave that one? To a, <laughs> <laughs> it's really, well, you've got you to end on a high, you know. Um, so, well, we're not quite done. What's, what's next for... What's next for for Blaine, what's that? What are the next projects coming up? Or you know, do you have a what's your trajectory like now going forwards? Cool. Um, so I've been with the London Fire Brigade now for two and a half years. Um, so I'm working full time as a firefighter uh, in London. Um, and your parkour assist assists you in that, you reckon? I mean, we've spoken about it a lot, but yeah, you, I you think would say so. your parkour is, your parkour has helped prepare you for that kind of work and makes you better at it. Let's say I, I think parkour has definitely prepared me to face this job. In a, in, a, in a more positive way for sure um not in the obvious ways i'm not like diving through windows and, and doing <laughs> stuff like that but i guess I, I know that's what you would love to hear <laughs> but um just being able to, to enter places that someone might need a bit of help in whether that's through a window or up onto a balcony or there's really small details that happen every week week in week out where i might be able to do something a little bit easier than somebody else uh if another firefighter was to do something uh, also i guess my approach to things that are scary. There, is, there are moments, I guess, in that occupation where there is a lot of risk or there is something happening that is just a little bit scary for someone that's less experienced, such as myself. Um, and I guess my approach to tackling fear in general can be applied to anything else. So the things that, the things that I learned through parkour, being present in the moment, remaining calm, um, trying to be logical towards things, they've all applied to firefighting for sure. And the scary situations that I have been in, I've been able to kind of take a breath, slow down, and relate it to something else that I've done in parkour and, um, and work through it that way rather than allowing it to overwhelm me. So um, I think parkour prepared me for being uh, in that occupation quite well. Um, and certainly the mental side has been, has been good in a lot of ways. Like being, one of the things we used to do in Leicester quite a lot 
when we train and broke a jump is once you break the jump, then once you say, okay, I can do this jump, then you better be able to do that jump, whether it's raining, whether it's dark, whatever it is. Um, and one of the things we used to do is once we broke the jump and we were comfortable, we'd say, okay, we're ready to enter this state where you would line up the jump, you'd stand there and wait, and you would have somebody else say, go. And when they go, you have to go immediately and try and break that jump to show you that you've really got it and you're ready anytime. That's what it is. And that's an interesting thing to carry across to kind of the, the, the fire brigade in some ways, because at any time during any day, any night, you could be called to absolutely anything. You have no idea what it is. So you're kind of, your brain is idling at a certain level, ready to go to anything um, for that shift. And whilst you're on duty, that could happen. You could go to absolutely anything in the next 10 seconds. So it's a really interesting thing to kind of be on the cusp of going somewhere and doing something. Um, and then at a moment's notice, that's it. You go do it. So that's kind of cool. It kind of relates to something that I learned in parkour of kind of always being ready for anything and just letting your mind kind of idle and be ready to go do whatever needs to be done. Um, yeah, that's quite a cool thing that I guess directly carries across from one to, to the other in some ways. Dude, that's amazing. So fire brigades, big thing, obviously. And um, what else is, what, what, what else is next for you? What, what's your, I'm focused on that projects? right now, actually. That's my, that's my main focus. It's just becoming uh, better at that job. It's given me so uh, many rewarding experiences in the two and a half years that I've been there. I feel like I've been able to make a positive difference in many people's lives, um, as I did with coaching. And I kind of feel like this is the next step for me is exploring this a bit more and seeing where, where it leads. Um, I love the job. I love the people. I love being able to work with um, people in the city and help them in moments where they need some help. No one calls us because they're having a good day. It's always a bad day for them. Um, so... Yeah. I'm getting stuck into that. I'm learning the job. Um, it's, a, it's a job that you learn from every single day. The people that I work with are incredible and they have so much experience. So my job at the moment in terms of my life goals is just being a good father, being a good husband, trying to become a better person, getting my training in and learning to do this job to the best of my capacity because it's something that I'm really passionate about um, and I can see me doing it for a very long time. Dude, with London Fire Brigade, lucky to have you, man. I mean, there's a, you know, you've got a real um, dedication to, to excellence, which, which is obviously going to carry over there. So, um, uh, and you've, it's great that you've managed to impart that to so many people around the world in your teaching, um, your coaching and tutoring and all that. So uh, I'm sure a lot of people um, would like to thank you for that. Um, I'm sure everyone here listening in um, would, you know, like to thank you for your time, um, uh, uh, as would I, for giving us, you know, so much time and, and, um, uh, allowing us to deconstruct um, Blaine a little bit. Um, uh, I think over the last sort of hour and 45 minutes, it's been really cool. Um, we could talk for hours. There's so much more stuff that I could talk to you about. Um, but unfortunately, we've got to call it time on that one. Um, yeah, let's do it again. It's been really good fun. We will. Maybe we're gonna. Maybe we're gonna. You know, get some uh, some three people um, sit downs going on uh, with 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 some some of the old schoolers uh, and get some chats going. So we we'll definitely we'll definitely bring you back. Um, but yeah, it's been super interesting, really useful, um, and I'm sure very inspirational and motivational for loads of people out there. Um, so do reach out to Chris. He's uh, he's on social media channels as Chris Rower. You can find him. Um, do drop him a line if you've got any further questions or whatever. Um, if we didn't get to your question, very sorry. Um, obviously, there have been a ton of questions and there's so many areas we could, we could talk about. We might, make, we might do a second part, as someone has just posted. Um, so we'll do a part two sometime and come up with a, come up with a sequel to the 80s movie that is Chris Rauer. Um, and, uh, but yeah, man, th thank you very much for your time. It's been absolutely awesome. This will go live, everyone. So we'll put it on, um, we'll put it on YouTube. Uh, it will stay up there forever. So you can go back and watch it again um you can also catch stefan's one up on our youtube channel the parkour generations youtube it's already there so yeah you know take your pick you know you've got stefan or blaine um so uh you go and find that there this one will also go up there um so you'll be able to see it um and if you have any more questions then reach out to blaine but thank you very much for your time man it's been really really cool and thanks for the opportunity it's been awesome to catch up um Thanks to everyone who, who joined in and if I missed any questions along the way, then um, as Dan said, please shoot me a message and we'll get to them as soon as we can. So um, thank you very much. It's been, uh, it's been really cool to relive a lot of those uh, memories and, and kind of insights and drag out a lot of things that I hadn't really thought about for quite a long time. So um, I appreciate the opportunity. Um, thank you very much. And I'll catch you guys all soon. All right. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you very much. All the best, guys. See ya.